Um, but welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome to the, our, our lab here. We have a very important guest. This is Dr. Tom Helicar. I think you're out there. I can see your, um, I can see your login. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our class there. I have known, thank you. I have, thank you very much for coming. I know that you're very, very busy and we are indebted to your being here. This is actually a very, very uh, exciting time for us. We always enjoy having uh, speakers come and talk to us, um, you know, people from the outside world and it's, it's, um, it's very, very exciting. Um, let me just go ahead and give you um, give some, some give you some background there, um, Dr. Helicar, and what, what we're doing here. This is a um, an introduction bioinformatics course. Um, we have basically covered everything between um, well, from the central dogma of biology between like you know um, working with DNA, uh, working with RNA, and working with protein, and then we extended um, that protein area into protein folding, protein domains, and some very basic protein protein uh, interactions. And so it's been quite an exciting thing, but unfortunately, I mean, we, we just don't have enough time in the semester to go through everything. And so I think that <laughs> you and I both appreciate that. But anyway, I'm just blabbering. Uh, please introduce yourself and then um, take it away. It's great to have you here. Great, great to have you here. Thank ahead. you very much uh, for having me uh, here. So I'm gonna share my screen. Yes, it should be shared. You, you should be able to share it now. <clears throat> Can you see my presentation slides? Yes, it's all there. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, all right. Perfect. So thanks again um, for uh, having me here uh, today. It's been a while since I've seen you, so hope you're doing well, Oliver. Um, and uh, I, so, so I have uh, sort of, I, I have some slides to kind of uh, walk you through uh, my journey and uh, but I do want to make sure that um, you guys can ask questions. Uh, so so I really want this to be more informal than than formal. So feel free to uh, jump in and ask questions, and I'll ditch the deck if needed, and we can just have a uh, conversation as we go forward. So uh, so my name is uh, Tom Helicar. And uh, I am an associate professor in the Department of Biochemistry at the, the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. But uh, even though I'm a faculty in biochemistry, I'm uh, by no means a, a, a biochemist. And uh, I always, you know, if I were in, the, in a mathematics department, which is where I was before, uh, I would probably have to uh, put the same dis, uh, disclaimer up that I'm not a mathematician. And so I kind of, I'll walk you through sort of who I am or, uh, or you know, how I got to where I am uh, today based on, based on my experience. And so one of the things that I want to focus on um, where I've spent a lot of my uh, education and also professional life is uh, in uh, computation and, and bioinformatics as they pertain to life and health sciences. So uh, as you can probably tell by my accent, I'm not from around here. I was uh, in fact uh, born in, uh, uh, in the Czech Republic uh, where I spent the first uh, half of my uh, life. I uh, can't believe it's been 20 years now almost since I left, uh, but I was born and raised in this uh, uh, city called Brno. Uh, which is the second largest city in, in the Czech Republic. And uh, the area uh, of the Czech Republic that Brno is located in is, is the wine country uh, of the Czech Republic, the, uh, where Prague is and, and that uh, western part of the Czech Republic is, uh, is the beer country. So I'm proud to be uh, from the uh, wine country. Um, so when I was uh, when I was seventeen or eighteen, I got the opportunity to uh, come to the United States and, in particular, to Omaha, Nebraska, as a um, exchange student in high school. So this was during my uh, junior and senior year in in high school. And so uh, when uh, when I was coming, when I was selected to be uh, an exchange student. Uh, they told me you'll be going to Omaha, Nebraska, and I'm like, where the hell is that? I, I, I you know, uh, living in the Czech Republic, I'm like, I only know, uh, you know, California, New York. <laughs> I, I don't even know where that is. 
uh, but nonetheless, I went. And it was a really phenomenal experience. So I spent that year in, uh, in uh, the high school and then I went back uh, to the Czech Republic. And uh, it was, uh, uh, I took some differential exams to, to make sure that I, you know, uh, would meet the GED requirements in the Czech Republic. And so when I came back, I started uh, in, uh, at the technical university uh, focused on uh, information technologies and computer science and engineering. And I started my undergraduate, uh, my undergraduate studies there, uh, majoring in, in computer science and engineering. And this is a little bit different than the system in the US. Uh, in, in the Czech Republic, you, you do your, uh, your, your high school degree is assumed to cover basically, you're supposed to learn all the general requirements. And so when you go to college, you already have to know what you will be majoring in because uh, the, the bachelor's degrees in the Czech Republic usually are a three-year degrees uh, because you don't do the first year, uh, first two years of general requirements as you do in the US. You jump right into the technical uh, 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 content that you would usually pick up on in the you know second or third year in the US. And so, um, so, so I, uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but, uh, I like computers. And so that <laughs> I like uh, playing computer games. So I figured, okay, well, I'll, I'll start a computer science uh, degree, but, uh, that was the, the level of decision-making that was going on in my head at that time. Uh, but so, so I spent about a year, uh, in, in this program. And then after a year, I wanted to go back and, uh, uh, visit uh visit my friends in omaha again and and uh and also uh improve my english in in the field of computer science and engineering and so um when i came uh, to the us uh, i actually uh ended up uh joining the the computer science department uh at the university of nebraska at omaha and uh, my goal was initially just to stay here for a semester, improve my English, and then, you know, go back. But uh, uh, I met my wife, and she sort of changed my plan. So 20 years later, here I am still in Nebraska. <laughs> but uh, it, it, was, uh, it was really where, where I started getting exposed to, to this idea of computer science and, and, uh, and life sciences, and uh, in particular, I would say the one person who really uh, changed my trajectory um, was uh, Dr. Rogers, who was at that time uh, teaching discrete mathematics. And uh, uh, during that time, he, uh, he got a uh, NIH grant uh, to build a mathematical model of biochemical pathways. And he was looking for undergraduate students to help him do that. And so, uh, you know, I didn't really know much about biology or biochemistry. And in fact, in high school, that was my least favorite uh, subject. So I said, hesitantly, sure, I'll try it, but I have no idea where this is going to take me. And it actually turns out that that really changed uh, my life in a way that that's not where I would, I would not be today where I am had I not taken that chance uh, or had I not volunteered myself to, to be involved in that the research uh, project. I, at that time, I was also sort of going through uh, uh, midlife or midlife, mid undergraduate life uh, uh, crisis uh, where I was studying computer science, but then I was thinking about it and I'm like, I don't know what I want to do with that degree because all I could, uh, again, my naive uh, uh, teenager mind was uh, uh, showing me only options related to building software for banks and that just did not seem uh, like a very rewarding uh, career. Obviously, uh, there are many careers that you can, many very awarding careers that you can pursue uh, with uh, computer science uh, and engineering degree. But I never imagined uh, the, the link between that and life sciences and biomedical research. And so, so working with uh, Dr. Rogers uh, took me into a whole new world of computational modeling. And so 
why do we need uh, computer models in biology? And I'll, you know, feel free. Uh, so this is a question to you, all you guys. Why do you think we need computer models in biology? And feel free to just shout out the, uh, what you what you think. I think uh, it's just like some of the stuff like protein folding as was mentioned is just too uh, too vast for us to do on our own. Uh, we kind of need the computer models as like tools uh, to help our understanding. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Connor. That, that is that is exactly the reason. And and so when we talk about computer models uh, in in biology, there are many many types of different models and. Uh, uh, computer models of uh, 3D protein structure uh, are one of them. The computer models that uh, that my lab focuses on are more computer models of the network systems, um, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. And uh, but exactly what you said, Connor, the, the there is this huge explosion uh, in terms of the amount of data that have been produced in life sciences. Uh, whatever scale you look at, whether it's the genes or, or RNA or proteins or uh, uh, physiology, there have been, the community has made so much progress in developing new technologies to measure about everything and anything uh, in almost real time that more and more data are being generated. And these data in turn, these different pieces of uh, the building blocks of cells and of biological processes and, and uh, uh, of diseases form these very complex networks. And that is what we focus on in understanding not just what are the different pieces of the biological system, but also how do they interact with each other and how do they impact uh, each other? Uh, and also, you know, so, so this, this last slide is more, you know, implies more of the molecular uh, level of data, you know, uh, drowning in data. But, but even if we look at the physiological level, the world we live in, um, you know, uh, Google Watch uh, being able to being able to not just tell time but also be able to measure your health indicators and a lot of these smart devices coming onto the market means that not only do we have more fun with technology but that also means more real time data about ourselves about our health and and the indicators of of our health and so uh, it doesn't matter whether you are considering a career in uh, uh, life sciences research, whether it be in ag or, or biomedical, or you're thinking about a health profession. Wherever you look in, in health and life, life sciences, you will be dealing with more and more uh, data and that are necessary, uh, that, that you need technologies and computational approaches to uh, integrate and interrogate to generate new hypotheses and, and new insights into the biological system, which then in turn uh, further drives the development of these technologies and, and computational algorithms and so forth. And so, as I mentioned before, um, we are uh, our research group and, and my career has kind of uh, has taken me into this world of biological networks. And so um, in terms of, you know, how can computational models help us understand this this mess uh, that we have to deal with uh, at almost every layer of biological organizations. So this is just a metabolic network this this depicts the human metabolism but it doesn't matter if it's human metabolism or if you look at the protein protein interaction networks they're just as complex if you look at uh how cells uh, of the immune system interact with each other it's just as big of a mess and so so you have these networks that you have to deal with uh, at every sort of aspect of of biology 
Uh, and so, so what, what these, uh, uh, what do we need network models for computer models of these biological networks is, is for example, you know, we can ask the questions, what happens if you change the environment uh, of, of this, uh, of this system, the inputs to the system, how does that impact, uh, how does that impact uh, uh, the different pathways and, and the overall response of, of the cell or of the biological process. Excuse me, you can also use these models to identify uh, drug targets because, you know, it's a computer model, so I can simulate uh, the inhibition of every single component of the system much faster than I could do it in the lab where I would be uh, testing uh, the knockout, uh, you know, through CRISPR or some other strategies. Uh, uh, how I would be testing the impact of inhibiting a particular component. And, you know, more so, you can also look at combinatorial therapies. You can generate hypotheses about what if you had two drugs or two intervention points in these complex networks, how would that help uh, with a particular disease? Perhaps, you know, we, we, we all know about uh, drug toxicity. Right, and so what if you have one drug that we know is pretty effective at uh, at helping with a particular disease, but it's relatively toxic? What if you had a second drug that could alleviate that toxicity, right? And again, there are so many combinations that you would have to be testing in the lab that you just there's just no way in our lifetime that we could test all of them. Uh, but with computer models, you can simulate the impact of, uh, of these uh, millions of different combinatorial approaches to, uh, to diseases. And so now going back to, uh, you know, when I was an undergrad and, and I mentioned uh, Dr. Rogers. Uh, and so, so Dr. Rogers pulled me into this world of biochemical and biological networks. Uh, and uh, we wanted to we wanted to understand uh, more from a theoretical perspective, uh, not necessarily disease specific, but we wanted to understand how these uh, biochemical networks uh, and in this particular uh, case at the protein level, why are they so complex and, um, and uh, how do they function? How do they sense their environment? How do they help the cells sense the environment? And how do they use those signals to make a decision uh, about whether they should grow, whether they should die, whether they should feed, or and where should they feed? Where you know where is the food? Cells have to make these decisions, and so and these signal transduction networks, these protein uh, networks are what facilitates uh, these, uh, these decisions. And so, you know, every one of these nodes in this network is a protein and these, these edges here are the interactions between them. And so this is, this is an old uh, picture of that network that I ended up building. Uh, and so to build this network, I ended up reading uh, hundreds of, of uh, biochemical and, and biology papers to be able to put this together to understand how each component is connected to, to another component and so forth. I had to learn uh, uh, more mathematics. I had to learn Boolean algebra and, and logical modeling. Um, and so I was now beginning to integrate, you know, and describing biology with mathematics, but then it turned out that, okay, I, I can describe this system mathematically, but uh, how do I run it? What does it mean to run it? And at that time, there were no simulators to be able to execute this, this mathematical uh, model. So I started writing one, and, and so I had to learn C++ uh, uh, to do that. And then, you know, as, as I was reading all these papers, um, it, you know, I was taking notes like crazy, but I would have literally hundreds of these papers with yellow highlighters highlighting the important pieces of the knowledge in those papers that that were basically the building blocks of knowledge uh, to uh, for these uh, for every single interaction in the model and I'm like oh this is not really a, a very efficient way of doing that like what if I want to 
you know, I, I had the I had the stacks of papers organized first by nodes. Each drawer was a different node, and it was, it was just not uh, it was just not very scalable. And so, so I started learning about writing web applications and utilizing utilizing uh, databases uh, to to hold uh, this knowledge. And so, so this was really foundational experience for me, not just uh, in terms of learning. Uh, learning about biological systems, but really learning and understanding uh, the opportunity that there is for integrating computer science and technology development and, and mathematics in, in biology. And so, um, you know, so so I sw during that time, you know, as soon as my eyes were opened, I I switched uh, uh, to uh, UNO uh, was I think it was at the time they were the second or maybe third uh, undergraduate computer science program who opened a new uh, minor or major. Um, I think it was a major in in bioinformatics, and so I switched to the major in bioinformatics. I graduated in 2006, and then also in 2006, I uh, I decided to continue on that path and uh, start working on uh, my PhD uh, through the Department of Pathology and Microbiology at the uh, medical school in uh, in Omaha, and um, I continued to work with Dr. Rogers as my primary advisor, and uh, it actually helped me quite a bit because. Uh, the work that I had done with him as an undergraduate student, um, we didn't finish all of it while I was an undergrad, and so we continued. I was able to continue with him as a PhD student, and uh, we ended up publishing uh, a paper in a pretty prestigious journal on on exactly what I was uh, mentioning before, uh, trying to show evidence that it is these complex. Uh, signaling networks or these complex networks inside of every cell that gives rise uh, to that behavior of, of the cell and the capability to the cell to respond to the, you know, uh, diverse and many times conflicting um, uh, signals, input signals that they can receive on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, you know, the, the, the world that the cells live in are... Uh, are equally complex to the world, to the complex world that you and I live in. So, so the cells have to make decisions about what to do when there are conflicting, uh, when there are conflicting signals. So for example, for us, uh, when you're driving a car and you have a red light, you know you have to stop, right? When you have a green light, you know you can go. But what if you have a green light and then there is an ambulance going through the intersection, right? So suddenly you have uh, two conflicting signals uh, that you have to process and you have to process it very fast to make a decision. And so cells really live in very similar environments that, that we do. Um, so, so I focused on, uh, during my PhD, I, I focused on uh, that sort of research, understanding the, the, the purpose of these complex biological networks. Uh, and then uh, for my, uh, the, I finished my PhD uh, relatively fast in about three and a half years. Um, and, and due to, you know, uh, partly due to the fact that I was able to build on what I was doing as an undergraduate student and, and was able to publish this, uh, this paper uh, in my second year during my PhD. And so then, then, uh, for my postdoc, I still stayed in Omaha. Uh, I guess I must have really uh, grown to love Omaha at that time. So, so I did uh, my postdoc. Uh, as a postdoc, I was working still with Dr. Rogers uh, back in the Department of Mathematics at Omaha. And uh, at that uh, point, I started focusing on more applied uh, sort of uh, applied aspects of computational modeling. Um, during my PhD, I focused more on the basic theoretical aspects. Why do we, why, why have cells uh, and, and biological systems evolved to the point that they need such complex networks? 
And then during my postdoc, I started focusing on, can we use these bio, uh, computer models of these uh, biological networks to better understand diseases and to uh, perhaps identify uh, better uh, uh, therapies and drug targets that could be used to treat these different diseases. And so we spend a lot of, I spent a lot of time on uh, influenza, uh, HIV infection, as well as cancer. And uh, it was, uh, it was during this time that I also started, uh, continued, I continued to realize again, and, and really uh, continue to think about how can computation and computer science help me and help the community in, in biomedical research. And so here became another challenge. Uh, you know, I, I was pretty good at building models by that time. I had done it for 40 years, basically, by the time I was postdoc, four or five years, uh, including my uh, undergrad experience. And so we had some undergraduate students then working with me. And so we started making these models bigger and bigger. And they actually, at some point, this, this was a model of signal transduction in, in macrophage cells, which are a type of an immune cell. Um, and uh, and the, the model was growing and growing to the point where uh, looking at, you know, looking at the, the model on the screen, like this, this cancer model, it's like you've got this big hairball that suddenly the computer, the computer allowed me to build a bigger model, but now it's making it harder for me to make sense out of it by looking at it. And in fact, uh, you know, to be able to trace those different lines, we ended up, uh, uh, this, uh, this girl, her name is Alyssa, uh, uh, who was helping me with this model, we ended up printing it out, uh, printing out the model, the, the, the network uh, of the model on this massive uh, uh, piece of paper that took uh, about half a conference room. And so I started realizing uh, again that uh, we really need uh, more uh, technology to solve this problem of now, how do we visualize these uh, these systems? Just because we can simulate them on the computer doesn't mean that that's going to solve all the problems. We also need to be able to visualize it, and we also need to be able to build it. Uh, much like I did during my undergrad and, and PhD, reading hundreds of papers, uh, Alyssa was also reading lots of papers, and uh, we realized that, uh, okay, you know, my background was in computer science and engineering. Uh, that's what I started with. I was an undergrad and just a student reading about these different pathways. Uh, but, but I realized also that there are scientists out there, wet lab experimentalists, biochemists, biologists, who spend their entire careers on these different pathways. They actually, they can spend their entire career on working on that one protein-protein interaction or that one 3D structure, uh, a crystal structure of, of, uh, of an enzyme. And it's these scientists who have the most intimate knowledge about the different pieces of this big puzzle of, of these biological systems. And so we had the idea of what if we built a platform uh, software that enables experts working in these different areas of the uh, of the biological system to collectively build models of those biological systems, much like a uh, uh, open source software is built, right? Linux, uh, that's that's an open source uh, technology built by many, many software engineers wor working uh, in different areas of the technology. Uh, some may be working on the kernel, others may be working on, uh, uh, on, on the graphical interfaces and, and different packages and, and so forth. And so why couldn't we have the same technology uh, or similar approach, technology that facilitates a similar approach to building uh, our digital twin, basically, right? Uh, and so we started, uh, so, so, so that idea started uh, when, I was a, uh, when I was a postdoc. Uh, developed some uh, prototypes and uh, early versions of this technology. And then in 2013, uh, 
uh, I uh, jumped into the bio biochemistry department as a as a, a assistant professor, and so you can see now, you know, so I started in computer science, uh, but then I went to get my PhD out of a pathology and microbiology uh, department. Then I went to a mathematics department for my postdoc, and uh, and then as faculty in, into biochemistry. But none of those departments really define me or in terms of who I am or or what my skills are. It's really the collection. Uh, the interdisciplinary collection of, of these experiences and, and the people that I have worked with that define uh, where I am today uh, as sort of a, a computational biologist or systems immunologist, I would say, um, if you had to put a label on it. Um, and so uh, when I started as a faculty in 2013, uh, we started really developing uh, that platform and uh, the platform is called Cell Collective today. Uh, and you can, uh, you can uh, find that technology at, uh, at this uh, web address. And so when, when we started building Cell Collective, we really focused on sort of four key principles. One of them, uh, making modeling attainable to anyone, not just modelers, and that is extremely important because the state, as I have realized over the last, uh, uh, you know, uh, many years that I've been working in this field, is that is the, the potential of bioinformatics and computational biology is very much limited uh, because it's been limited to other bioinformaticians or computational biologists. Basically, the state, the, the state of the, uh, the the state of the field is uh, is as if you to be able to drive a car, you would have to be a trained mechanic, right? And uh, I think we would all agree that that would be pretty dumb if if that were the case, right? Uh, instead, to be able to drive a car, you need to understand the different assumptions behind driving the car you have to understand that if you press the gas pedal the car will go if it is in gear uh, if you press the brake it will slow down if it had been moving right uh, you, you have got the steering wheel you've got the knobs and all of that stuff so you understand the assumptions behind uh, behind uh, the different uh, interfaces that allow you to control the car well computational modeling and bioinformatics have to get to that exact same level and that's where also technologies can can help you should not have to be a, a bioinformatician or or a computational biologist to be able to build and or use a computational model these models should be made accessible in such a way that you could be a doctor in the clinic uh, uh, being able to simulate what is the best dosage, uh, dosing uh, regimen for this particular patient given their disease, right? Uh, and if we can fix the accessibility problem, then we can actually make uh, the construction of our digital twins a collaborative and more scalable uh, venture because we can now have the biologists uh, working in the wet lab who are not trained modelers or bioinformaticians, we can have them help us build these models. And uh, also I've learned over the years that just when you build a model doesn't mean that somebody is going to use your model. Just like with uh, computer code, software code, when you build software code, you have to annotate the crap out of it, right? You can't just put up a bunch of code uh, that, uh, uh, that only you understand. Uh, you have to document it. Same with the models. You have to document every single piece of, uh, uh, piece of uh, the component uh, or every piece of the model uh, that, go, uh, that, that makes up the, the system as a whole. You have to make sure that it's documented uh, through annotations, which allows you to link the, uh, the knowledge uh, in the published literature that uh, as a supporting evidence uh, for the components that you have in the system. And then together, uh, if we have these pieces, then we can also increase the reusability and reproducibility of, of these models and the experiments uh, that we do with these models. And so these are sort of the four major pillars 
um, uh, behind Cell Collective. And so every time we develop a new feature, it has to help with one of these four aspects of the technology. Otherwise, I'm not building that feature if it doesn't do that. So uh, just a quick, uh, uh, quick uh, run through uh, the technology. Uh, are there any questions? I had one quick question about that last slide. Yeah. Um, so like one of the things I was thinking about as you were saying it is like, um, so like how do you make it accessible in the way that you're describing? Like what do you change about the tools that, that allow for that ease of use for like more people to use it? And how do you in incentivize, I guess, developers to make it like that Excel or that accessible and open to everyone? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so the first question I will hopefully answer um, uh, in the next couple of uh, slides that have some gifs in there uh, to show how we actually build how the models are being built. Um, you know, and then how do you incentivize? So there's two levels of incentivization that has to happen. One is at the building of the technologies, and that's actually being sort of sort of slowly uh, self uh, uh, self resolved within the community because I see now more and more papers coming out by saying, "Oh, here is a here is a tool uh, for." RNA seq data analysis and it's made accessible so that you don't have to be writing python code or you know things like that and so so there seems to already be this uh, this notion that tools have to be more accessible and so i really like that and i think it's the incentive is being thrown at people um, all over the place because you know the federal agencies for you to get a grant to to develop uh, this tool federal agencies want uh, uh, what they call for example nsf the national science foundation wants you to think about the broader impact how does your uh, research or in this case the development of this technology reach as many people as possible and so you actually have to start thinking about it in one natural way is to okay well can i get other people scientists who are not bioinformaticians can i get them can i develop the tool in such a way that uh, that they can use it so so that's one incentive another incentive is how do we incentivize the wet lab researchers to contribute to uh, building these models and that's a, that's a very hard uh, uh, not to crack at the moment. And uh, there are communities of systems biologists working with clinicians and, and wet lab researchers to really understand how we can make that happen. And, and it doesn't happen uh, it doesn't happen as, as uh, nearly as, as much as I would love to see it. Uh, but I, I think it will at some point because only now, are some of the tools being more accessible so so we can actually really start only now start having more serious conversations with wet lab researchers on how to uh, how they can contribute uh, uh, and how we can incentivize them to build these models did that uh, help answer your question yeah yeah that did thank you mm -hmm. Yeah, so so with so we we started building cell collective as a, as a research tool and uh, uh, where again you would have whether it's a computational biologist or or a wet lab researcher any anybody with any background in, in modeling and, and mathematics and computer science could build uh, and simulate these uh, these complex models and we actually in the course of building this technology uh, of course uh, uh, you know just like I was sort of a you know uh, uh, a, gu a guinea pig or a helper to uh, to to my advisor as an undergraduate student as we were uh, building uh, this tool. Um, uh, I hired uh, I hired uh, a number of biology undergraduate students who I knew didn't have any computational modeling background or computer science background. They were purely biology students, and uh, we had them uh, help us test the technology to test the accessibility of the technology. And it was at that time that, uh, that I realized that, okay, well, first of all, I can see that they can use the technology. And so it's, it's accessible. It's if, if a uh, 
freshman or sophomore biology student can use this technology, a PhD wet lab researcher should be able to use this technology. Otherwise, they're just making excuses at that point, right? Um, but what I also realized, and, and it sort of dawned on me uh, in the same way because I went through the same experience, I started seeing that the students are actually learning the biology by having to build these models. And so, and then I was thinking to myself, you know, as an undergrad student, uh, I, I told you at the beginning, I biology and biochemistry were my least favorite subjects. And then I, you know, signed myself up for this uh, massive project to build a mathematical model of signaling uh, networks uh, where I didn't know, uh, I didn't know what phosphorylation was when I started, uh, you know, and so uh, I started at the very beginning and, but by the time I built that very first model, I knew a lot of biochemistry and signaling and, and biology. And so I realized, well, I wonder if actually we should be teaching biology in a different way. Maybe biology students should not be memorizing these pathways from didactic lectures or, or from uh, picture, static pictures in textbooks. Maybe they could learn biology by building and breaking and simulating these models. And so uh, over the last uh, six years, uh, we've, we've expanded the technology to also be a full-fledged education technology where life sciences students can, in fact, learn biology and biochemistry in this, in this way, which is exactly the same way that uh, biomedical researchers are studying um, uh, diseases and biological systems. And so to answer your, uh, Connor, your, your first questions, uh, how, how did we do it in such a way that, uh, that uh, uh, one can build a model without the technical aspects? And so through a, a lot of iterations with uh, our users, basically what the user does is that they draw uh, the network, but then uh, by defining the certain relationships between these edges, uh, in a language that the biologist understands. For example, the biologist understands that uh, if something phosphorylates something else, it'll activate it, but it can only happen if there is another enzyme uh, or another kinase that phosphorylates it, which is, makes it a condition, for example. They understand that kind of language. So combining the language that we see uh, in the biological literature uh, with, uh, you know, uh, and, and abstracting it to the point where you're simply drawing the network, you can actually build uh, models of any complexity. And so as, as the user is drawing these networks, it is in fact building all the mathematics behind that network so, so that you're actually building a mathematical model that you can simulate. Uh, oh, okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, then the simulations of this system. Uh, so, so now because it's a web-based platform uh, with GUIs and stuff, you can you can uh, start now sort of doing in silico experiments and test a lot of different what if scenarios, just like you do in the lab. So you've got this this network here. The, the nodes change colors based on the activity levels that they're in. And then you've got these different sliders where you can change the inputs going into the system and you can see the, the immediate change in the, in the dynamics and the response of, of the different components of the system in this uh, time, series, uh, time series graph. And so you can do mutations, you can uh, you know, you can do everything that you do in the wet lab, except it's on the computer. Uh, and so, you know, you're not using in vitro model, you're using a computer model to do that. So uh, in Cell Collective now, actually, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I should have grabbed a more recent, uh, more recent uh, screenshots of the, of the model catalog, but we've got uh, a few hundred models now uh, of biological systems. Uh, ranging from uh, uh, cell differentiation systems to uh, uh, infectious diseases uh, to plants and uh, um, uh, cell cycle and, and so forth. Um, and so these models are publicly available. And so anybody can actually, uh, anybody can actually uh, go into the model, make a copy of it and start contributing to it. 
uh, in, in the way that I uh, showed you earlier. You can also just create your own models and then you can make them, uh, you can make them publicly available um, and you can also share them with, uh, with your collaborators uh, directly. Uh, and so uh, Cell Collective continues to grow and now it's been used in uh, all over the world uh, for both education and, uh, and uh, research. And so, as I mentioned on the education side, uh, you know, we first wanted to, this was independent of uh, education or research. We wanted to eliminate the bar uh, of, of uh, modeling and make it, uh, make it accessible to really anyone. And in terms of students uh, and the education aspect of uh, our technology is that uh, we can give students the ability to learn about biological systems in a constructivist and inquiry-based, and most importantly, scientifically authentic fashion. So exactly the same way and using the same tools that scientists and professionals use, right? And so, as I mentioned before, our goal is really to get away from didactic lectures and static memorization, but really go towards um, how scientists use technology to understand diseases. And so some of the, um, I think I have maybe 10 minutes left here, so I'm going to wrap up here quickly. Uh, but one of the things that we're working on, we have been focused on over the last, uh, I would say, four to five years, uh, is we, I want to understand the immune system. So the immune system, the human immune system, obviously, is extremely important, uh, um, especially amid uh, COVID here. I think that's been on top of everybody's mind. Uh, but the immune system uh, consists of a number of different cell types that play a big role, uh, immune cells. And then there are these cytokines that, that uh, mediate the communication between these different cell types. And when we look at uh, how all of this comes together, uh, we start again, uh, I should have asked you uh, what you think that will amount to, but it amounts to a, a network. And it turns out that you know again you this is a this is a network that you will find in a published paper or or you will find in a textbook, but it really doesn't depict the true complexity of the of the system. Here is a more realistic uh, 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 version of uh, the structure of the immune system, and this this uh, this graph actually is a is a graph the static version of a computational model that my group has been building of the immune system as a whole, taking into consideration uh, uh, the, the different, uh, different immune cell types and the cytokines that make that communication happen across different organs and, and among the different cell types. Um, and we've, uh, we've incorporated uh, a number of, I think we have now 11 different pathogens that uh, you can stimulate the immune system with. And then you can start asking questions uh, and, and studying the system as a digital sort of, again, digital model, digital twin of the immune system and start asking questions such as, how will the immune respond? Uh, how will the immune system respond to a particular infection? And we already know it for many of these pathogens. Uh, we didn't know it for COVID, but that's exactly you know you could have we could have built a model. Uh, but the problem with COVID is that we didn't have any uh, very much information about uh, about the interactions in the in the immune system, and so that makes it more complicated. But now we can now we do, and so we can start asking questions. If you have COVID and you also have uh, MTB infection, how will that change uh, the immune response? Or you know, in in countries where that are more exposed, such uh, you know, a continent like Africa, where uh, there is much more exposure to infectious diseases than in a, a Western country, you can start looking at many different combinations of. Uh, potential, uh, potential infectious diseases and start predicting their impact on the immune system. And so our long-term goal is to, is to really have what I mentioned before, a digital twin or simulatable human model where uh, we can use it to teach students about uh, the human body and diseases, but we can also have uh, clinicians use these, uh, use these uh, uh, digital twins to uh, find better therapies, 
and optimize therapies for based on uh, different uh, demographics in a more precision medicine and personalized medicine fashion. So that's all I have. Uh, I will be happy to take any questions for the time that we have left. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I had a couple more questions. I don't. <laughs> sure. But I'll just jump in. The first one. Uh, I'm a biology student, so math isn't necessarily my thing. But what level of math do you um, kind of recommend for people, you know, looking to get in this field, or at least specific classes? Specific classes. So, so I would, uh, you know. Um, I would not be afraid of math, first of all, because um, as I mentioned, if you're going into life sciences, it's going to be everywhere and it will eventually put you at a disadvantage if you fear uh, math and if you fear uh, computation and, and computer code. Uh, you you will need to learn it. You will need to be, you don't, uh, and, and the, there is also a difference. You don't, for example, have to be a software engineer to be successful in this field. You just need to be able to, for example, take the data, format it in the way that you, uh, some other program will understand, uh, clean the data up and things like that, right? You, you need to not be afraid of, uh, you know, writing a small computer program to be able to do those things for you. And uh, same with math, uh, you know, math is, uh, you have to have some sort of a foundation, but the, then it really depends on how deeply you want to go in any particular area of, uh, that utilizes bioinformatics and computational biology. You can be again, once more of a user of the math, or you can be the, developer of the math behind these uh, biological systems. And so it really depends on where, where your career and experience takes you and, and uh, which uh, year are you in? Uh, so I'm actually, I, I transferred in as a junior, so a late start for some of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what I would say is experience as much as you can. Like, Take if, if there are any bio motivated, uh, bio inspired mathematics classes, take them and see what you like about it, see what you don't like about it, and, and identify sort of try as much as you can. And really, this goes for to this is my biggest advice to any undergraduate student is that during your undergrad uh, uh, career, you guys have a very unique opportunity. Uh, to try and fail as much as you want without any consequences or very little consequences. Because if you take on an internship that you absolutely end up hating, that's a win because you know you hate that topic and you will want to know that before you venture into it in a, in a more serious fashion like a PhD program where you're committed for five years to it, right? Um, or, or even longer. Um, and so try and fail in as many things as, as you can uh, while you're an undergrad because uh, the stakes are very low, uh, but the potential outcome of that is huge. And, and I saw it uh, in, in my own experience. All right, thank you, that makes sense. My last and uh, final question is, um, you said that people could like publicly uh, put out their own models using your website. Is there some mm -hmm. sort of like validation process that has to go through before it goes public? Yeah, yeah. So, so we have uh, to be able to publish your model. It has to be fully annotated, uh, and uh, the model has to be part of a peer-reviewed publication. So it has to the model has to be published as part of a manuscript, uh, which which undergoes a peer review process. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me, um, thank you, Dr. Helicar. That was really, really exciting here. Um, let me ask a question of my own here. So when you first started out by writing the Cell Collective, when you first set, put that software together, 
how did you know the functionalities were? How did you know what people are going to, or what kind of research people were going to use uh, the software for? I mean, how did you know what kind of software to design after um, um, to, you know, to, to handle these models? Yeah, so, so that was really, like at the beginning, it was uh, really to uh, make my own life better because I, I was building uh, these complex models. And the first model that we published, that was the, the most complex, uh, the largest, most comprehensive model that was ever published of, of a biological network. Uh, and so uh, so I, I was the user of the system. And so I really designed it from my own uh, user needs. And then as I uh, was sort of maturing uh, as in the field and, and started working with collaborators and uh, with lab researchers, I, you know, I began developing additional conversations about, uh, you know, how they perceive these computational models and things like that. And so then was abstracting from those conversations, the need for additional features. Okay, are there any other questions for our speaker? I think that um, sometimes in this class, uh, Dr. Hillikar, sometimes you'll find that the questions will come a little late because people need time to think things over. And so I see that we have your email here, which is, yep. which is great news. And so um, I do encourage, hopefully with, with your permission there, Tom, but I encourage everyone to send emails if they have any questions and really to dig into some of this stuff here. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ground covered today. And I think this is actually, um, actually it's very exciting stuff. I mean, this is really, it's just, it's just awesome science. <laughs> awesome. So last chance, any last questions before we break? Okay, well, if and when those questions come, you have the email. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for coming to talk to us today. I, I really, really appreciate it. It's great to see you. And, and by the way, for, for the class members here, I have known Tom here for probably about 10, 15 years, perhaps. We were both at school together. And so yeah, we actually, yeah. we were both in the math department together at the same time. And so as you were building some of the stuff that you were talking about today, I was there to see uh, to, to, you know, to see you, you, you programming some of the stuff. I mean, we, we shared a grad office, which was actually quite exciting. Yeah. I, I remember that you would say, oh, it's amazing. I just found this new connection between this and this. And, and it was like this, this huge moment and we're all like, just like that and how exciting that was. And, and there are many, many, many of those moments there. And so it's really exciting to see um, how far your, your, your product has, has come along. I mean, it's really, really exciting. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks again for having me here. And uh, please don't be shy to email me if any, anybody has any questions or you're uh, looking for interesting PhD topics uh, or whatever it may be. Uh, thank you all. All right, everyone, you have your class participation for today. Go ahead and hand that in as soon as you can. And then we are out. Everyone, take care. Have a great day. Thank you, Tom. Have a great day. Bye-bye.